Steve, did you kill Elvis? The world thought I was Jack the Ripper and Charles Manson combined. Yes, indeed, there were serious accusations that I was responsible for Elvis's death. When we wrote the book, uh, along with the three bodyguards, uh, the, the Presley group had a, a gentleman who was uh, a former FBI agent, and uh, he managed to get a copy of the, uh, uh, of the, the proofs. Right. And Elvis, the night he died, was reading it. As a matter of fact, I believe he was reading it on the John. And uh, that's what they said. And the next thing is, they uh, found him on the floor the next day. So I have the dubious distinction, if, if indeed it's a distinction, it's not really, but of being told that I killed Elvis. It's a heavy load. Because in the summer of 1977, you wrote a book called Elvis, What Happened? That's and indeed. two weeks later, Elvis died. That's right. Well, it was, t it was the two weeks before, when he did die, it was actually on the, the day, the official day of the publishing date. Oh, my God. I mean, I, once again, I mean, that's a, a stroke of luck or a stroke of real tragedy. And of exactly. course, I'm not making light of it. Of please, course. please, please, I'm not. Uh, although people have made light of it and people have certainly been very nasty to me. Now, and this I'm a very, very sensitive person. <laughs> now, th this book sold, what, three million copies oh, that no, summer? No, 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 much more, much more. I think throughout the world, I, I forget how many, uh, how many languages it was in, but it sold 13 million throughout the, throughout the, the Western world. So we hungry too, yeah. When you wrote the book, Elvis was alive. So who came what? up with the title, Elvis, What Happened? Amazing. Apparently, there were all the, um, the heavyweights of Ballantine books sitting around and saying, what will we call it? What will we call it? Anyway, a young man who I've never, ever met, and he was uh, the, the, the coffee boy. He came in, gave coffee to everyone, which they ordered. As he walked out the door, he just said, Elvis, what happened? Just like that. And then they, then they used it. Uh, I've never met him. Uh, no one's ever seen him. And he came up with that brilliant title. Amazing. Now, one of the great stories I heard from Rupert Murdoch himself since I was at that party when you retired from the New York Post. And he said that to thank you, he wrote you a check, I believe, for $35,000. This is back in 1977. That's and right. he wrote you this check, gave it to you. You went out that evening and you had a nice time. A rambunctious time, probably, and lo and behold, the check was lost. Well, we retrieved it, but I must confess that I had a lot of trouble uh, keeping upright. You know, I kept on falling over. I don't know what was wrong at that time, why, why I kept on falling over, but I did, and the check was momentarily lost, and we retrieved it, and, uh, and that's when I had a... a another book on ready to go. So I had uh, about $65,000, and that's when I got my house. Thank God for Rupert Murdoch. Now, you worked for Rupert Murdoch for over 40 years. Yes, 43 years, yeah. And you, you worship this man. I loved every moment of it. Uh, I still worship him. He's a fantastic individual, an incredible mind, <clears throat> and yet, very much of the common man. Now, you know he speaks very highly of you, and I know that because at that party, correct me if I'm wrong, Rupert Murdoch said to the group, he said, Steve Dunleavy is the most beloved employee in the history of News Corp. God bless his soul. Your dedication uh, to your work, your inspiration to others, um, your loyalty to the company or the paper that you're working at has absolutely defied description was exceptional. I've never seen the like of it in all my life. I appreciate the, the, uh, the, the praise. I really do. Uh, very touched by Rupert Murdoch. Now, you started out in Australia 
14, 15 years old? Uh, I was 14 years old as a copy boy, yeah, and uh, my uh, father, actually, he got me the job, to be quite honest. I should have got it myself, but anyway, my father was a, quite a famous news photographer. Uh, and it happened that I uh, got a job. I became a reporter for the Sydney Daily Mirror. He was working for the Sydney Sun. And many times when I was a reporter, I'd be working against my father. Right. So that uh, led to some interesting uh, little contretemps. Including the legendary tale, and you can clarify, about the time you were competing against your father on a story outside, some far from Sydney, and you uh, decided to uh, go after his tires on his car. Yeah, he was a photographer, and we were in a place called the Blue Mountains, and there was supposed to be a church group uh, who were lost in the mountains. Uh, and there has been some, some uh, many, many fatalities there when people get lost in these mountainous regions. But anyway, my father, went down into the valley with the other photographers and reporters. And uh, I was in this car with the, the driver. Uh, and uh, he turned to me and uh, gave me a screwdriver. And I looked at it and he nodded his head towards my father's car, or the car that he was uh, in. And uh, I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. So and you slashed your well, own I, father's I punctured, car. I punctured tires. the tires. And that prevented him uh, from getting to um, a post office about four miles away, five miles away, I forget. And of course, they had to get to the, in those days, you had to get to a post office to radiogram your pictures. So in the late 70s, uh, Mr. Murdoch and you led the takeover of the New York Post. Now yeah. that, that is a book and a movie and a documentary uh, in and of themselves. It was very difficult because the old New York Post was extremely liberal, extremely liberal, almost. They used to call it the pink sheet uh, or the, the commie rag. So he certainly put it on a new course. And uh, I was the second Australian to, to go there as a reporter. There was another guy first, a friend of mine, and my God, it was like pulling teeth to get people to, you know, recognize that uh, this is a wonderful, huge, pulsating city. For God's sake, cover it like it is. Uh, it was like the liberal Bible of the, of the Christian Science Monitor. It was. Uh, but you guys went in and turned the town upside down. Oh, we did. Yes, I'll, I will say that. Um, I uh, no, I pull no punches. We really went in and did it. And I can tell you, the, the uh, locals at that time, when I say the locals, I mean the reporters who were working there, who were with the old post, and they, they had conniptions. Uh, a lot of them quit. Some of them hung on. And some of them decided, uh, hey, this is what New York's all about. Uh, lots of crime, yes, it was a lot of crime. Uh, a lot of show business. Uh, and another thing, we always had, yeah, we had pinup girls in there too, to a degree, not a lot. But we always had some sort of pet story, a dog or a cat. And you had the screaming headlines. And we had tremendous headlines. What was your favorite? Any anything? My favorite was not written by me, it was written by uh, uh, Vinny Mazzetto. Uh, a very funny guy. He's not with us anymore, but it was Headless Body in Topless Bar. Uh, and that got a lot of attention. Headless Body in Topless Bar. It is the most famous headline from the New York Post. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. They actually used to have, they had um, uh, coffee cups with it on. All around, all around the town, you could buy coffee cups, Headless Body in Topless Bar. <laughs>